with uh, clarity on why we are gathered here and what uh, each of us can contribute towards preserving, how we can contribute towards preserving our, our heritage. I have the august responsibility of introducing the distinguished speaker uh, of the fifth annual lecture on safety and conservation of heritage structures. Ms. Nachodorji is the chief architect and head of the Division of Conservation of Heritage Sites, DCHS, which is the central agency responsible for the protection of heritage sites and cultural landscape of Bhutan. Her major contributions are in the field of conservation of heritage sites in Bhutan. She has successfully managed several national heritage sites conservation projects and instituted the first archaeology office in Bhutan. She also initiated the drafting of the first legislation for the protection of heritage sites in Bhutan. Currently, her focus is on the research of traditional construction techniques and materials in Bhutan and in raising awareness on recognizing the entire country, Bhutan, as a unique cultural landscape. Some more that I would like to add is uh, Ms. Natrudorji is uh, very much from Chennai because uh, she happened to do her higher education from Hindustan uh, 15 years ago and that is wonderful homecoming for uh, Ms. Natural Dorji. We're very happy to have you here. Um, several members of the audience also have links to Bhutan as uh, you will start seeing once they have questions after your talk uh, and that's a wonderful thing that uh, we have because a lot of people have experiences in Bhutan and we all look forward very eagerly to this talk because Bhutan to many of us is about an alternate path and we really look forward to it to hear from you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, good evening. And Vanakam, I think uh, that was the first Tamil word that I learned when I landed here in Chennai. That was 20 years ago, I think in 1996. And uh, this was an orientation that I was given into, especially when we were sent here to study our uh, bachelor's in architecture. Am I allowed to know? All right. I'm sorry. If you can't hear me, please tell me. I tend to be a little soft when I'm speaking. Um, uh, uh, 20 years back, I was one of the uh, 27 students uh, selected to study uh, in the southern part of India. Actually, before that, um, most of the Bhutanese students who finished their high school were always sent to the northern part of India as part of the government of India's support to build capacity in our country. And many of the students who went before 1996 were largely sent to the northern part, partly to, of course, IIT uh, for technical um, courses. And of course, uh, for medicine, they were largely sent to the Ames College. Uh, we were the first experimental group that the government of Bhutan wanted to send to the southern part of India. Because I think uh, they had heard a lot about the good education quality. But of course, um, since this was not a partner with the government of India, we were sent out to venture into the private colleges. And that's how I landed up here uh, studying in Hindustan College, uh, which I believe now it's a Hindustan University. So uh, I did my bachelor's there in architecture. And, uh, and I fondly remember uh, being here for the five years I was here. I think, um, of course, the first year was terrible. Uh, the, I felt the heat was going to kill us and eat us up by the end of the year. But I think after that, it was all smooth sailing. Um, I also remember that um, while we were here studying, we used to really envy people who were studying in IIT. That was all that I could remember. And the only opportunity we got to come here was uh, you to use the library. Of course, that was the best part of it. And of course, there was also this, what they had, I think, was the rock show. I believe it still goes on, Sarang. And I think that was one event where we got to come here in IIT campus. So that's what I remember very much. And therefore, after being f uh, here for five years and coming back after 15 years, and to be able to be here 
in IIT to deliver a, a lecture on a subject that I'm very passionate about. I think it's truly a blessing and um, I feel that uh, this is like a second home. And I was just mentioning to Pratyusha when she came and picked me from airport that I actually can't recognize it so much because in 15 years Chennai seemed to have changed <laughs> quite a bit. I can't even recognize the road. I thought the most easy road was the one from the airport to IIT, but apparently there are new roads that have been introduced. So it's very interesting that um, I get, get this opportunity. So therefore, I, before I begin my presentation, I would like to say that I'm very humble to be here among all of you today. And it is an honor and a privilege for me to be invited here to deliver the fifth annual lecture on the safety and conservation of heritage structure commemorating the World Heritage Day. Um, I would like to thank uh, National Center for Safety and Heritage Structures under the Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Madras, and of course the intact chapter, uh, Chennai chapter, for giving me this honor and extending the invitation. Um, I would also like to especially thank Dr. Arun Menon for playing an instrumental role in pushing the structural safety study of heritage sites in Bhutan in the last uh, decade. And um, of course, I'll tell you some of his contributions that he's done back at home, uh, which is part of my experience that I would like to share here. And I would also like to, again, uh, thank for all the arrangements. And I'm, I must say, I know that uh, Tamil Nadu and Madras is known for warm hospitality. And uh, from what I've been experiencing in the last two days, I think that hospitality, warm hospitality is still there. And I would like to thank again Dr. Arun and his team for extending this warm welcome to me here back after 15 years. So thank you. Um, the National Center for Safety of Heritage Structure at IIT Madras, uh, I believe, was established for a reason uh, that I also truly believe in. It's a new way forward to protect heritage structure across the globe. And therefore, I'm delighted to share my experience in the field of conservation of heritage sites in Bhutan as, as to commemorate the World Heritage Day. Um, oh, sorry, I, I believe um, I, 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 I can, I've met a couple, but I have not much idea how many of the distinguished audience here um, today have been to Bhutan. Therefore, for those who have been to Bhutan, please bear with me with what I'm going to be telling you. Uh, but those who haven't, and I am assuming one, one day you will come to visit Bhutan, um, I would like to begin my lecture with a brief introduction to Bhutan in a context of cultural heritage, um, which would help me set a clear background on the conservation of heritage structure in Bhutan. I think um, um, most of you are aware where Bhutan is, so I don't need to say that. We all know it's a very small country. It has over 38,000 square kilometer coverage. And uh, one thing um, that, of course, in many of the written documents that we continue to stress on is Bhutan was never colonized and due to, largely due to the geographical conditions. So we had, of course, the high peaks and the rugged mountains, the dense forests. So I think that played in our favor. And therefore, because of this, the cultural traditions and customs uh, very, that were indigenous to Bhutan thrived very vibrantly until the 1960s. Uh, that's what we feel the timeline is about. I think it's from the 1960s when we started opening the door, uh, where we started to have uh, ratify, be part of the UN, when we started building roads. I think that's when we started to see that uh, as in an, when we were opening our doors, um, there was also some of the negative impacts could be seen on the socio-cultural fabric of the country. Uh, I have put together here some of the milestones that kind of really make a difference in what we did in the field of heritage sites. Um, of course, the tourism starting off in 1974. We were very careful when we started off um, tourism industry back in the country. I think we were very aware of our neighboring countries, especially Nepal, of the influx of the backpackers and what it did to the country over the years. And therefore, we had a tourism policy called the um, low volume, high value. And I think uh, this applies except for India and, of course, the South countries. I think it applies to all the tourists who Buta visit Bhutan. They have to pay a minimum tar tariff every day of uh, $260. 
Of course, uh, I must mention that $260 includes everything, a package. You get your three-star rated rooms, you get a guide, you get a chauffeur-driven car, all that included. But that was largely to uh, keep the volume low. And of course, very recently, there was also a cap on how much tourism would be able to come into the country because I think um, we want, our service industry was not ready to receive that many and we didn't want to portray that Bhutan could provide, be providing very low service for the amount that they were paying. But of course, now that doesn't exist ever since we became constitutional democratic country since the year 2008. So the cap has been lifted off so as many tourists can come in and the impacts are now slowly starting to be seen. Of course, uh, television also plays an important role here uh, because uh, we got to have television only after in the late 1990s, 99. That was, uh, one of the reasons why we were not allowed to have televisions, especially the satellite and everything, was the influence that it would get, which you can, of course, see now with the digital world. You can see that the children back in Bhutan is no different from the children back in anywhere across the globe. So I believe that is also because of the televisions. So with that background, um, I can't shy away from mentioning cross-national happiness because it was in the 1970s, 60s, we opened the door, 1970s, um, the fourth king, uh, Jimmy Singh Wanchu, coined what we call the cross-national happiness. Um, His Majesty was very wise, so he um, felt that uh, the development philosophy of the country must be based on achieve, achieving cross-national happiness of the people and not cross-domestic uh, uh, cross, uh, product. So it was GDP was off the shelf. It was more on the GNH that we were trying to focus on. It had four pillars, and out of the four pillars, one was to to uh, preserve and promote culture. And that's when how the whole conservation of heritage sites and the cultural heritage comes into context, because it was with this 1970s development policy, development policy that we continue to follow all the way through even now. And that also became like a guiding document for any development work that we do in the country. You, had, you have to be able to at least check your boxes in one of these four pillars that stood. Either one of your developmental activity must contribute towards good governance or towards socio-economic development or environmental conservation, or the, the, the last bit of it, the preservation and promotion of culture. So that continues to stand even strong even to this day. Because we had this uh, development philosophy, now we had to institutionalize that, and that's when the, again, another royal decree established what we call the Special Commission of Cultural Affairs, which is now my office, which is the Department of Culture. The name got changed in 2003, and uh, then it became the Department of Culture under the Ministry of Home and Cultural Affairs. And one of the main mission, of course, is, was to conserve, protect, develop, and promote all tangible and intangible cultural heritage. And that time, we were only seeing cultural heritage largely through tangible and intangible. So um, as we segregated here, um, tangible, we were largely looking into structures. Again, for the, those, those who have already visited Bhutan, um, many of our structures, these are the iconic architectural masterpieces that we have that also portray the identity of the country. So we have the zongs, which are the fortresses. So what you see on the top, uh, all the different kinds of zongs. Um, we almost have around uh, close to uh, 14 zongs that were built uh, uh, before 17th century onwards. But what we are building now, similar structure in the southern part of the Bhutan, is it's a, it's a copy of what we used to have now uh, then. Uh, we also have the temples which fall into the tangible cultural heritage and you can see the famous tiger nest up here on your left side, uh, lower left. And uh, the stupas were also part of it. We had different types of stupas. And then we had the naktsangs. Naktsangs were largely vernacular homes but that belonged to either the royal family members then of course and also or the, um, the family, noble family. Uh, in the country. So these were, again, large vernacular houses that were there. We also included in the tangible cultural heritage then the traditional bridge. Of course, um, the technique of building them exists, but not as uh, 
vibrant as it used to a decade ago. So this is also a dying skill of trying to build back bridges in wooden structure. Uh, intangible, of course, I think uh, uh, the earlier speaker clearly mentioned what intangible cultural heritage meant, and particularly in the context of um, cultural heritage and heritage sites, we have what we call the 13 traditional arts and crafts. I think if you're visiting Bhutan, that's, uh, there's a center which uh, is a must visit where you get to see this 13 craft. Uh, out of this 13 crafts, the six crafts, which are the secular crafts associated largely with the construction of buildings, including the uh, zongs, uh, they are the what you see again first on the extreme puzzle, the carving, that is, I think, uh, 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 essential element of our building. Then, of course, woodwork, uh, you have the stonework. Then you have the bamboo work, which is largely for the wattle and door partition works we do. Chuzo and Gazo, which is largely to do with the metal work. And of course, um, uh, until the early uh, 20th uh, century, we had a lot of these iron chain bridges, which again, that's a dying skill. So when the skill, in, the intangible part of the skill dies, and the tangible aspect is also kind of uh, slowly uh, depleting and dying in the process. And of course, the, then out of the 13, the seven one is largely to do with the religious arts and crafts. That's to do with the painting, the statue making, the writing, um, uh, also uh, in, uh, putting in the, uh, the relics within, inside a statue or religious object. And then you have the uh, uh, weaving aspect. Sorry, that didn't go well. So now with that background, I wanted to um, quickly explain on the uh, traditional uh, Bhutanese building, how they are put together. I think this is a very standard way of how we explain what composes traditional Bhutanese building. And this is, uh, I must say, it, a fort or the zong is built in a similar way. A vernacular house is built in a similar way. A stupa is built in a similar way. It's just the amount of the proportion of materials that are put and the form that takes place. So the walls are predominantly stone masonry wall with mud mortar. Rammed earth wall is more predominant in the western part of Bhutan, and that was what got affected with the 2011 earthquake. And the remaining structures are largely made out of wood. So the floor, window, door, roof is all made out of wood. So this is what uh, traditional Bhutanese building uh, would look like or it would be composed of in the context of material. Um, well, um, since I have to stick to time limit, and if you have questions, please, if you feel that I've not uh, answered some of the questions you might have in your mind beforehand about Bhutan, please feel free to let me know later. But I would like to jump quickly that uh, in just last two decades, while of course with the institution of the office in 1980s, what we realized was um, the pace of development was very quick. And very quick to an extent that even as a, a local there, we find it very difficult to grasp the change that is going on. So this is just a pictorial representation of what the capital city, Thimpu, looks like in 10 years. A picture on to your left is the um, Thimpu Valley in 2003. And the other side on the right side is Thimpu Valley in 2014. So in 10 years, you can see the transition, the paddy fields are disappeared totally. The landscape no longer represents what Bhutan is known for. The buildings, of course, we have a guideline rules and regulations on how buildings are to be built. When it's built, we are quite strict about it. But of course, the uh, building owners will always some fi find ways to add on or do things that are uh, not uh, within the rules and regulations and manage to build. So then you have these haphazard uh, construction that come about. And I think the architecture also has started to look a lot different from what was expected from the guideline that was made uh, in the late 1990s. Because of that, um, because we were feeling this impact, so when we had the constitution uh, drawn up in 2008, um, it was very important that this was recognized and therefore when it comes to the responsibility of who should preserve, protect, and respect cultural heritage, it was uh, clearly mentioned it's the fundamental duty of every citizen. And that is what we are now trying to invoke back. We are trying to tell everyone that it is not the government's job to come and help out everywhere. It, it used to be uh, vibrant with community coming in together. 
It used to be an individual responsibility, and this is something that we want to invoke now, and which absolutely requires to be invoked with this current day, particularly when I think uh, become, after becoming a constitutional democratic country, the politicians have really know, uh, they've learned how to play with cultural heritage as the cards to win favors uh, of the uh, public. Um, with this rapid development, um, then of course the heritage sites being there, um, what we realized was we only had the development philosophy then that kind of really guided us. So it was important we had a legislative framework. We don't even have a policy on culture. Bhutan is known for its cultural heritage. And amazingly, we don't even have a policy written document, anything on culture. So it was very important now with the change coming in that we have a legislative framework. And that's what we ventured on since the year 2010. We started off with what we call the Heritage Sites Bill, which uh, when presented to the cabinet minister, they instructed us that we merge it both tangible and intangible. And that's what we got um, after almost five years of working on it. We have what we call the Cultural Heritage Bill. And here what we are, um, this is a very tall order and I know it's going to be very difficult to achieve. We've been questioned for putting this uh, statement up in the bill in itself. But we are going to be recognizing the entire country as a unique cultural landscape. And that puts uh, a lot of pressure with uh, new economic developments coming in. They are not in favor of this. But Bhutan being small, um, our identity largely coming out of the cultural heritage, we felt this was absolutely necessary if we want to remain as what we envisioned uh, in the 1970s. So therefore, this bill uh, will be going in the parliament this summer. And if it gets passed, it will become an act. And then, of course, we hope that this will trigger a lot of support in the field of cultural heritage. And like I said, of course, when you talk about cultural landscape, we're talking about tangible and intangible cultural heritage should be protected and safeguarded with the understanding of its association with natural settings and lives of people of Bhutan in such a way as to manage the cultural landscape. So um, here, the key word is relevancy. I think what we have uh, learned in the last 20 years is when we talk about um, protecting, promoting, and preserving cultural heritage, it's also important that you look into the dynamic aspect of it. You just do not look into the static and be stuck on something that used to exist. But we're trying to see that you continue to be relevant to your natural settings. And if you do that, I think the respect is bound to come in. And that's what we hope to, again, um, get out of this uh, bill. Uh, because of this bill, we had to again restructure how we looked into heritage sites. So now that's where we come into the heritage site. Normally, uh, we had a very monumentric, uh, monument-centric approach. The government was focusing on um, very big monuments like the Zongs when it comes to upkeeping. Um, the monastic body was also keen and inclined in that. So uh, we also realized that, of course, the building composition is nothing different from what is, uh, uh, I think, in some of the architecture, the, the monuments are made very different from the vernacular homes. But here, we, the composition was very same. So then we decided to segregate into three different parts, uh, which is the heritage building, which includes all religious structure, palace, vernacular houses of cultural heritage value. So it's a value-based, actually, uh, listing. And then we had the cultural site, which we were talking about groups of traditional buildings with the natural settings. And also, when you say near area, these are, I think, um, I think it's easy for India to associate with this. These are holy sites, you know. They may not necessarily have any structure. It could be just a stone, but it's uh, an important site. So these would fall into cultural site. And of course, archaeology. Um, archaeology, of course, we introduced it uh, in the year 2008 onwards. Uh, we have an office uh, that now looks after the archaeology, but that's definitely not the priority at this moment because I think what is underneath can remain underneath as long as the above is protected for now. So for the time being, we've kind of a little pushed them aside, but we are focused more on the built heritage above, um, above the ground. I would 
Does anyone have questions? Because I don't want people falling asleep after a long day. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's very kind. So, thank you. So, but if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. So, um, when it comes to challenges, of course, um, I could go on about the challenges that we face, but I've tried to segregate into three simple uh, uh, major challenges that we have. Of course, the impact of modernization. Uh, I think that's with the development comes uh, the rural urban migration. That's a major problem back in our country. Uh, we have a word called gungtong. Gungtong in our language means actually empty households. So we're starting to see our rural households becoming empty over the years. People are migrating to urban areas and therefore a lot of pressure in the urban areas but your own uh, uh, family homes are being abandoned. When there's nobody to look after, they fall into disrepair, and then of course they are, they are getting dilapidated. So that's one of the major impacts. Then again, our monuments uh, and the religious structures are uh, categorized in the living heritage because they continue to be in use as, of course, I cannot say as the day it was built, but at least uh, what was what it was being used 100 years back, it is still being used as similar in that same fashion. So in that context, the main custodians of these structures become the monastic community and, of course, the administrative unit of the district. But the monastic community are the main custodians and they have a major say with the Sarachi sites. And because they live in it, and they are exposed to what is going around, they want change. Because they're too tired of living in the same kind of conditions. And they change, are of course, uh, not very subtle, but they are quite in, uh, ostentatious in the way that they want. Uh, where there is no carving, they would want a carving. Where there is no, um, probably, um, if the timber, for instance, it's from pine, which is the local timber found. You know, and the, what they want next is they want hardwood teak, which is only there in the southern belt and they're of limited number. So their requirements have changed so much so that now it's very difficult to um, even negotiate sometimes with them at this moment because I think uh, they feel they, are, they deserve the change because of what they've been doing and taking care. Whereas we feel this is a little too overwhelming to be um, kind of negotiating in that extent. So that's one of the major changes. But I'm not going to touch on this much. I will largely touch on the natural and the man-made disaster. Um, I felt that since I am in IIT, I cannot just go about philosophy. I need to get a little more technical. So I will try to stick to the natural and man-made disaster. We've experienced many disasters in the last 10 years, and that really questioned the whole concept of conservation of heritage sites back in Bhutan. And of course, for us, um, we believe that, as I think uh, Madam mentioned, Sujata and Shankar mentioned earlier, we also believe that it's a, the heritage sites are a legacy of the past and irreplaceable source of creativity and inspiration and that we need to continue having as a Bhutanese and as a, as a citizen of a small country. I think that's absolutely important that we keep that and sustain it. The values are important. The identity that it gives us is very important. But to keep that at bay and be there, I think it's then we have to talk about how to keep these structures up and running the way they have been staying before these disasters. So the safety interventions come into picture. Um, I think for some of you, of course, m many of you might know about this, but some of the disasters that I was mentioning were since 1994, we had what we call the GLOF, is the, um, uh, the glacial lake outburst floods that we had because with global warming, our <coughs> lakes up in the um, snow cap mountains are melting. As they're melting, then they kind of sometimes um, have these um, glacial lake outbursts. And then we have these floods, which uh, are very difficult to um, um, mitigate. Then we had in 2009, the Cyclone Isla had actually um, brought in major windstorm in the eastern part of Bhutan. And that was another disaster we faced. 
And then, of course, the 2009 earthquake, uh, which I think the epicenter in itself was in the eastern part of Bhutan. Then, of course, after that, two years later, we had another uh, earthquake in 2011 with the epicenter in Sikkim, and that brought in a lot of disastrous effect on our heritage sites. And uh, then, of course, the man-made disaster, which is partly, um, I think, a problem that we still continue to face, uh, the fire. And we lost a very important 17th century building, 200 meter in length. Uh, one of its uh, unique characteristic was it continued to be covered in shingles, which is another uh, roofing kind of a traditional indigenous to us in the wood. And, and the cause of the fire was short circuit, electrical short circuit. And it was very sad to see that we lost that building, this 200 meter big monumental building in just two hours, it was raised down to ground. So that was another uh, disaster that we felt. Uh, some of the pictures, um, I think for uh, uh, um, the reason I put many of these pictures was many of the buildings that, uh, coll uh, of course, they, uh, some of them fully collapsed, but the partial was largely out of plane failure that we had. And we had many of the walls falling out. Um, you can already see from here in the picture that many of these walls are done in stone and mud masonry. Um, when we went through our statistics after the damage and loss statistic, we realized that um, this, uh, in addition to the cultural heritage structure, the heritage site structures, um, there was a lot of damage to shelter, which meant the rural homes that were there. So again, that really got us thinking to work towards how to do recovery after the earthquake. And when we're doing recovery and reconstruction, that is when we first faced a challenge in 2009 where people were not willing to rebuild back in traditional form, uh, in, in traditional construction technique and material. Um, they felt they were too weak. And uh, sadly, in these areas that got affected by the earthquake, we didn't have many modern reinforced concrete structure to you know, kind of make a, a, a clear show of whether they affected the reinforced concrete structure as well. They were largely composing of vernacular houses of this make. And therefore, they felt, OK, the urban Timpu city didn't get impacted so much. The buildings, RCC buildings that we had there, didn't seem to have gone through any much damage. So everyone wanted to reconstruct using reinforced concrete cement. Now, we are not, um, I think, as we mentioned, as, uh, as people working in the field of conservation, we do not actually uh, try to encourage people to use reinforced concrete back in our country not because we have no faith in this uh, material and the technique, it's largely because the workmanship is very poor, because this is very foreign to us, and we do not know how to use cement and steel well. We do not know how to give the cover. We do not know how to do uh, the design calculations in the local level as we do. So we try to have them encouraged to something, the skill that they know. Um, this also brings a lot of community harmony. Unfortunately, that was not what was happening. Um, with the earthquake, we also tried to bring, even for timber uh, construction, it was very important. We again further retrain our carpenters. They knew how it was, how it had to be done. But of course, uh, we we talk a lot about nailless um, uh, timber construction, which means, of course, we don't use nails, but we use a lot of dowels to put the timber together. But uh, with, again, uh, access to modern materials like nails, everyone had started using nails. They forgot how to make the joinery details. Well, they didn't forget, but I think they just made it easy, so they avoided the joinery details. And that's what we learned after the earthquake when we started assessing that many of these buildings did not have the joinery details that was there traditionally. So we had to, again, revive back the whole system that used to uh, exist before and kind of remind them that these are good practices and you need to continue practicing that. Uh, this was very difficult because the craftsmen had difficulty accepting this in the beginning, but uh, then again there was this intervention from um, what you have here as public works department. We have the Ministry of Works and Human Settlement. Uh, they had actually looked up to many of the guidelines that were there across the region 
and of course the typical being introduction of the band and introduction of the vertical reinforcements. This was something that they quickly picked out from the other guidelines and tried to impress on the, the workers, the craftsmen, that they must use this. Now that, that because of this ended up being a challenge, so which I'll again explain. Uh, we realized again, um, our engineers who had uh, studied outside and come back, were more confident to work with, again, reinforced concrete structures as compared to their own material that was there. So the Ministry of Works and Human Settlement refused to take up the assessment on rammed earth structure. They said, that's a structure we don't know, and we don't want to take any risk on it, because the, um, that was one. Second, the insurance wouldn't take any insurance on these buildings. So. Um, they were willing to take insurances on reinforced concrete buildings, but on the rammed earth, they flatly denied saying that they don't know how well it would perform, so therefore no insurances for them. So these two, again, factor played a critical role, and therefore the Works and Human Settlement refused to do any kind of assessment or support in this uh, further kind of promoting rammed earth construction during the recovery and the reconstruction period. So again, we came in, we did a study assessment with help of uh, UNDP, and we, of course, always insisted that Ministry of Works and Human Settlement must come together with us, even if you do not believe in this material at this moment, but you need to come board together because it's their agency that is able to tell across the country that you get to use this and you do not get to use that. So we didn't want them to kind of say, Ram is uh, unsafe, so don't build it anymore. That, that would mean 60% of our building is unsafe because most of us are living in Ramdot buildings back at, in our homes. So that was the challenge we had. And then, of course, like I was mentioning, I only picked out one of it. The horizontal band thing is a major, uh, I think, uh, the interventions that normally is introduced. And I think this was more popular with the BAM earthquake, where this band worked very well after that. And then uh, many of the uh, experts who had come in our country also insisted ladder beam or a band across to um, be more, uh, to make the building more resilient to uh, seismic activities. But what we realized is, okay, we, we, we agreed, we were all willing to accept, we started putting the ladder beam in place. And you can see here, our walls normally range from 600 mm, um, 60 centimeter to, uh, in the fortresses, they go up to 2.5 meters in thickness. So trying to put band in timber and trying to put the leaves of the stone together was a major challenge. And we were not using lime mortar, we were not using even cement, we only used mud mortar. And we did not even know what kind of consistency of the, the mud mortar we required. So then there was this question of um, putting steel reinforcement. And there were a lot of examples that were being thrown that um, if you could see here in the corner, you can see the bamboo posts. They're saying, oh, very flexible material that can be done, so please use it. How this would perform, we had no clue. But of course, uh, we had no solution, so we decided to implement some of the uh, projects that we were working on. We decided we will implement them, we'll document it, and we will see now when the next earthquake comes to their farewell or not. But that was a very dangerous decision that we were taking then in 2009. And we do have actually now two buildings uh, on our record where we've done in this method. And I think it's only time and I think events that will be able to tell us how it would fare. But our, our craftsmen had really difficult time trying to integrate things together. You know, they, they, as much as you try to tell them, put the leaves of the stone together, you cannot have them separate, they wouldn't listen. And they were just doing aesthetic treatments from outside. So because of these challenges that we're going, in addition to many of the others that I was mentioning, um, the Department of Culture, then my office, then started uh, taking up collaborations with experts from outside Bhutan more seriously. And it started first with the, <coughs> now I think, uh, it used to be called the National Research Institute for Cultural Properties, Tokyo. But now they've changed very recently to Tokyo National Research Institute for Cultural Properties. That's similar to, uh, it's, it's like, a, like my office division under the, the culture agency. 
and we worked very closely to understand ramjet structure and we tried to do the survey in two phases of course the study it was the architectural study as well as the uh, structural study in the architectural study uh, that was very important that we go parallel because when we talk about values uh, i think we're not just talking in the context of the safety of the building just for the structural reasons but also what value associated to this building that we must try to keep when we're trying to do the safety interventions so in the architectural study we had to identify architectural styles we had to analyze its historical and local features we had to identify traditional construction methods and techniques and then of course the crucial aspect of it assessing the awareness of putinis people about preservation of traditional structure i think this gave us an opportunity to really understand what do people think about it you know do do they still have faith in this um, um, structure or were they willing to use their skill to contribute in these works or did they want to shy away from it and totally turn their back to it so this was a major um, country wide assessment that we were undertaking and uh, because many of the buildings were damaged it was very easy for us to see the intervention measures that were done and amazingly some of the interventions like you know trying to put the joints which you can't see very well in that picture there but they um, some of them seem to have worked very well in the uh, okay you can see a little bit so um but what they failed over the time was uh, really understand how the skill that was being taught to them earlier because this is a whole master apprenticeship kind of uh, um, a training program that happens on the in the craftsman um, circle so that in that the the reason why they were doing it was kind of being uh, they, they they didn't pass that the, the reason behind why they were doing it it was something like automatically coming and they were taught to do it but why should they do it what if you missed out why why should you not miss them out that kind of reasoning was not being done so that was what we realized from the awareness understanding survey that we were doing then of course the structural study then that this was uh, um very difficult for putan in the beginning because um when we were trying to do the uh, analysis of material characteristic because none of the traditional construction materials uh, had gone through that uh, our rammed earth uh, didn't go through that kind of um, study um our stone masonry walls did not go through that study so it was very difficult to even collect material and go undergo testing and then we were trying to do of course uh, dynamic test was we something that we couldn't even think of then we were thinking of static testing micro tremor measurement and analysis to eva evaluate the vibration characteristic of the building as well as of the ground so these were small steps that we were taking and um around the time that uh, uh, we were undertaking there was uh, another fire in a, a small temple structure and we were able to use this kind of test case on this building because any how the walls had to come down so that was what we were trying to do then side by side with the earthquake um um in, uh, the, the as part of the recovery and reconstruction we got a big grant on which we managed to get a small part of undertaking what we call the na nationwide representational uh, sampling survey of the ramjet earth structure and this was largely to understand the typology and the construction how ramjet structures ramjet earth structures are being made in bhutan so again in this um we this was the first time we were venturing we were making a lot of mock um samples and trying to pull them down to understand how they performed as part of the um the resilience that they were giving with certain force being act on it and um but again this was very difficult because many of our ramjet structure when we kind of surveyed the amount of pounding uh, the 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 content the clay content the plasticity of the uh, the mud these were all varying from one region to another so it was very difficult again to make a typical structure and say this is how they would behave so these were some of the challenges that we were having and of course um in the last uh, since 2009 we just recently managed to bring a short guideline on uh, improving the seismic resilience and this was largely with an objective that uh, people continue to have faith in this kind of techniques 
uh, not just for the sake of you know being romantic and thinking that you must save, but also to kind of uh, give them uh, f uh, 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 bring out their faith in the skills that, of course, our buildings lasted for many years. We had experienced much larger earthquake in hundred years back, but we wanted to have them understand that the skill that they know, if used well, and if they understood why it was being done, we could still continue doing that. So th that was one of the main objectives behind it. And then the turning point in this whole study came uh, with the, the fire in June 2012 on this again, that structure that I was mentioning. Uh, in 2012, there was this major fire. The, all the timber components were totally burnt and all that remained was these large, massive walls. Part of it also uh, burnt in the process that remained. And uh, because it had a lot of sentimental values, today it gets burnt. The next day, the prime minister announces we are going to be reconstructing the entire zone. So that was like a very tall order. We had no assessment done. We had no clue about the impact the fire had. But the entire nation was uh, all into chanting that it had to be reconstructed immediately. And that was the challenge we had. Now, when you talk about reconstruction in heritage sites, I think that's always a question that is always asked to me. You know, how can you think of total reconstruction? Isn't that against the whole conservation philosophy that we have? But Bhutan has seen a lot of reconstruction, and this is what we presented earlier to experts as well. Punaka Zong, if you've gone to Bhutan recently, is what you see up on the right side, uh, of your right hand side. And this, I think everyone admires this song because it's very, very elaborate. Um, it's a masterpiece of its own, so uh, everyone admires, and I think it's kind of epitome of our architecture as well, Bhutanese architecture. But what this zone looked like in uh, over 100 years back is what you see from a Claude White picture. Not very different, but um, you can see the embellishments, the ornamentations, the, um, the added uh, pinnacles. They are a lot lesser than they were much more subtle. Of course, we, we had the bridge. Uh, you can see the bridge span became bigger because the water started to widen and then you had to change the bridge. But um, reconstruction during that time in the 1980s when there was this uh, fire was very, again, natural. Nobody objected to it, you know. And now if you ask, um, I, I, I don't know, in the field of conservation, um, I, if you are aware, there's uh, an expert by the name Yuka Yukalito. The, his books are normally what we go through when we're studying conservation. and. We also invited him here to talk about authenticity. Is that applicable to the structure? Of course, um, Yuka was uh, being very politically correct at that time, so we didn't get a correct answer on this, on the whole authenticity. Again, another structure which everyone visits in Bhutan, uh, that's the tiger nest. That also, again, same fire incident in 1998, totally reconstructed now, and that's what it stands. But our reverence to these sites have not diminished. That is what is important. I think we still value it as how it was prior to the fire and after the fire. So the question remains is, uh, is reconstruction a part of our culture? Do we accept it? And uh, if we were to accept it, is it okay to have interventions? Is it okay because many of these reconstructions that were done in the 1990s and 80s they were done in a way very similar to what it was done, ex except that um, a little expansion here, there, to make it a lot more comfortable is being done. So, but the usage hasn't changed. The reverence to the site hasn't changed. Um, but the problems continue. The deterioration problems are there. So these challenges continue to be there. So when we wanted to work on the Wong Di Patong Zong reconstruction project, the question was, what should we do after the fire? What remained of the walls? Should we rebuild them back using traditional techniques and materials? Should we totally avoid that? Because there was this one set of our team from the Works in Human Settlement who refused to 
uh, acknowledge that we should even consider uh, taking up traditional techniques and materials. We should try to use the modern technique. We must use RCC frames and clad them with stone masonry walls. And then, of course, there was, of course, the middle path in it. Should we use traditional techniques, but with enhanced modern in technology? We didn't have answers to that because there was a, 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 a division of two different thoughts, and we didn't know how to come to this. And that's when uh, we decided it took a year for us to come to that, but we decided to have a workshop called the Resolving Structural Issues to Traditional Buildings, particularly Zongs. This word, of course, very long, but what we wanted to see out of this is, even if right now the focus is on the Zong, the way the traditional houses are made are nothing different, they are same. So the answers that you will bring out for this Zong is very much applicable to the 70% of the building stock in our country. So this was what the, the, the deeper message that was there. But since we had to be a little pointy with our objectives of what we needed to achieve, so we had three major objectives there, identifying appropriate methods to analyze the strength of the existing wall. So after the fire, were, were we able to reuse it was a question. Second, if we were able to reuse it, how do we reinforce and stabilize the old walls uh, that existed? And then the third was the material technique and reinforcing measures for construction of the new wall over the existing. So we were looking only into three, and that's when, of course, uh, we headhunted for experts who were more inclined to understand our situation. And they, then we brought in, with much uh, discussion and references, uh, we managed to get on board four prominent structural experts, and among them included our uh, Dr. Arun Menon also. We had one geotechnical expert from, the, uh, from Germany, and an, an architect uh, who, of course, um, it's a foreign origin, but he's been in Bhutan for so many years that he had uh, a crucial inputs to the structure. And with this structure, we also brought in um, heritage experts as well. Again, there's always this debate, you know, when it comes to conservation, what comes, uh, what do you balance? And then we had this um, a week-long discussions and workshops. And then uh, with our experts and the guidance, and this was very instrumental, everyone agreed that we would all stick to traditional techniques, but with enhanced modern technology. And that was the challenge, because that was not being done in any part of the region, especially the Himalayan region, that was not being done. So because this came out very strongly, then we started working. And of course, uh, of the, the, the four experts, uh, uh, had made several recommendations during the workshop which we needed to follow through. And since we didn't have in-house expertise, we uh, took in uh, the, uh, Mr. Galmarani from um, the expert group and he saw through these recommendations that were being done. And uh, the main intention was uh, to incorporate state-of-the-art seismic resilient technology in traditional buildings uh, in Bhutan. So this was the drawing that we made after the um, fire. So we had the old walls, we had to build new walls, we had to make studies. So keying how to build them, that was a major study that we had to do, the coring of the samples, trying to see that they were stable. And um, I have to tell you, the Bhutanese structures, they don't have deep foundations. For traditional homes, you would get probably around at the maximum, we'll get 300 mm, or probably not even that, or so they are just built on the surface. For zong structures like this, if the profile is not very steep of the terrain, then uh, you they would go down to 1 meter to 1.5, maximum 2. And for very steep profile, only around 500 mm. So you, you can imagine that it just sits on it. And this particular site was even more challenging because it was part of the, the glacial lake uh, valley formation. It had major alluvial deposits. So even when we started coring, uh, digging boreholes uh, in the, on the site, even when we reached 25 meters from the top of the soil, we were not getting hitting a rock. And it was only alluvial soil that was coming out of it. So this was even more challenging. And later we learned with the study that 
the bedrock is only 50 meters below from what the top of that uh, terrain. So again, further challenge to it. So um, geotechnical part was one thing because there was again the sliding issue of the, the slope there. And then the material testing was very, again, another a nightmare for us because our motors were in mud and uh, we were asked to study the mud more closely and see also if we used it in mixtures that are locally available, how would they behave. So was, then we had to make different samples, try making samples and un understanding how they sh uh, kind of shrink over the time was one thing, but how they behave together with the stone was another. Because again, here it's not just the motor, it's how you put the stone together that also makes a big difference. So that was again a follow through. It took us many months to understand the stairs, remove them, how they were behaving. And finally, um, our stakeholders involved in this project, uh, they were very skeptical in a way of trying to bring these modern intervention measures. And we were only allocated out of the three part of the, uh, the zone structure. We were in initially given only one part to work on. And in that one particular one part, um, if you see uh, from this, it's that uh, what you far right, you see the long tower there. It's called the Utse, the central tower, was to work on that building because that's on the topmost. And then that would, if, if there was an earthquake or if you're talking about challenges, I think that would address many of the issues that we're, we're facing. So the recommendation made and the expert working on it finally with the kind of soil we had because it was all alluvial and uh, even if we went for micro piling it was going to be very expensive then we finally came down to putting base isolation and base isolation of course uh, studies do show that many of the heritage sites have incorporated them in Armenia I think in some parts of Europe Japan is a, a big um, big on base isolation, particularly on, on Nara, in Nara particularly. So then the idea was to have base isolation, which finally got approved by the stakeholders. And then we started designing and implementing them. Um, the, the Teflon, uh, um, the bearings and the uh, elastomias were brought in all the way from Switzerland. Some of it actually donated by the company. And then we got these um, base isolation done at site. This was again another uh, difficult part because like I said, reinforcement, uh, reinforced uh, cement concrete is not our uh, strongest point in working. So for this particular work also, we had to look up to um, Larson and Tubo who was working down the valley in the hydropower project to come and help us with the, making this high grade quality concrete. So they kind of helped us to make it and that made it possible. If they were not there, we wouldn't have been even able to do that, uh, even even putting the mix together, that, that was a challenge. So the <clears throat> the central tower structure had the, uh, had the base isolation foundation. Bond stone came very strongly from the recommendations and since the walls were as thick as two meters, it was impossible to have them made from stone, uh, they were more brittle. So then we came about with this, what we see here, and we named it Fritz Stones. The one stone became the Fritz Stones, we had to name them. Uh, we also decided to insert vertical reinforcements because of uh, when we did the study on the loading, um, the stone masonry was in compression, was good in compression, steel reinforcement was required for the tension. So that came about in the picture. And I'm sorry, I just I seem to. Horizontal bands again came back in picture this time in reinforced cement concrete, but very thin. And there was no way that we could hide them because I think if we wanted to conceal them inside the width of the wall, then you would have this uh, stone walls on the, uh, uh, oddly uh, a piece of stone wall on the side. That was not something that I was working on. And we are still heavily criticized even now that the band is showing outside the wall because they feel that we haven't done a good job of trying to conceal the interventions we've done. So I think that's going to haunt us a while for now because some of the politicians have taken up on this and very recently we had to write an elaborate um, and, um, report on why this was put and 
and uh, the politicians had easily had said, one of the ministers said, you have to redesign the entire building after it's halfway through. So you can imagine what is expected out of this. So we also realized that in the structure that I was telling, um, it was very important we have the rigid floor and its connection to the walls because we had the, uh, when, uh, during a uh, seismic activity, we realized out of plane failure was one of the major things. So that's again another interventions that we're using on the site. So basically the challenges that we faced was largely from the fire, from the fire thing point, we're still working on it. We still haven't reached the level that we want to reach at this point of the stage of the project. But uh, we are looking into compartmentalization. We are looking into increased access. And now we're going to be having a service tunnel in the middle of the courtyard running through and through so that this also becomes an access or an exit during a, a firefighting um, uh, time. And of course, uh, for uh, preventive measures, uh, put in the hydrants and firefighting equipment. Um, waterproofing, uh, the timber structure was a major issue that we had with many of our sites, and that's something we're working on. So we haven't progressed so much in these two areas, but the earthquake aspect, how to make it more resilient, I think some interventions have been done, well documented, and again, it has to be tested out with time with how if there is an earthquake, how it's going to behave. Because many of these, as advised by our experts, we didn't have the laboratory or the facility to undertake a lot of research and test them out. So because we did not have that, and it was very important we understand how to make this heritage site safe, uh, we decided to have a road map for what we would like to do from henceforth. So this roadmap is segregated into the architectural study and the structural study. They have to go side by side. And the architectural part we're taking up with the Japanese experts and a couple of the universities there as of now. And we are again more open to experts to come and work together.